Welcome to Redirect Immigration Law Perspectives, a weekly dive into the world of immigration law and its human consequences. I'm your host, Stephen Robbins, joined by co-host, fellow immigration attorney, Matthew Archambault. There's my email dinging in the background. That's a cool sound. That's very professional. Yeah. Well, is it important? Do you want to take it? Do you want to answer that email now? We can wait. Yeah. Let me just respond to this real quick. (laughs) Uh, So... Oh, oh, you're joke typing. I thought you were for real typing. Um, <laughs> that was Steven responding. Is this a... Yeah, there it is. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> These are pre-programmed drops in the software that we use. There's a, what do you Ooh. call it? That's a rim shot, right? Yep, yep. But that's also something else? No. I always I mean, feel weird saying that because it's... I think whatever. you wish it was something else. I just... Take that part out. I don't want to... Keep it in. Have, Matthew, how are you? Any big okay. victories this week? Any victories? Yeah. Oh, we got, <laughs> we got to read these uh, blog posts. <laughs> I totally forgot so about I, this. Yeah. I do have a case coming up about my client. She's a gay woman from Mexico. She's poor and she has some addiction issues. So the argument is she'll be persecuted for that if returned to Mexico as she'll be homeless and addicted and gay and all those things. And there are a lot of good reports on that from the UNHCR, Amnesty International, even the Department of State talks about police violence against LGBTQ people in Mexico. Sure. A lot of, you know, reputable news stories from newspaper articles, magazines, things like that. Reputable or reputable? Are they reputable? Is that the same (laughs) word? I don't know. I don't know. My English is not, is not very well, as everyone knows. So it is my second language. Well, and also the other thing in Mexico is the lack of a sort of mental health care infrastructure system and their approach to rehabilitation, right? So their rehabs, I'm sure you've done this research, but their rehab centers are horrible. (laughs) Well, and my client has no familiar support in Mexico. They've all disowned her because of that she's gay. So I think we laid it all out pretty well in our filing. Uh-huh. And the DHS attorney filed a bunch of blog postings about where rich white gay people can go in Mexico to vacation. This is the funniest thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, it's it's pretty normal for the State Department Human Rights Report, for example, to say something like, you know, they've taken steps to improve uh, protections for LGBT people. Nevertheless there's still reports of uh, violence by state actors against these people. So that's pretty normal for there to be some sort of like tension in the evidence of, it says they're, they're improving, but they're not all the way there. And so what's the current situation? And they decided rather than to like try and find something within the reputable source, they went to these blog posts that are, we'll, we'll post the links actually in the podcast notes. I mean, one is from... Ama Resorts, uh-huh. which is a, a resort that specializes in gaycations. Right. On the right hand side, the most recent blog post Plan a Safe International Gaycation, Tales of the City, LGBT series on Netflix, a romantic getaway to Puerto Vallarta, benefits of traveling to the beach. Anyways, this is all about how you can come and be super gay in Puerto Vallarta and, by the way, stay at our resort. It's not even like there's no author attributed to this post. Yeah, and they might have some type of stake in it. I'm just thinking. <laughs> yeah, they might be an interested party. Let's see. Anyways, it's basically somebody who works at a resort saying, Mexico is a very progressive country with progressive ideas concerning LGBT rights. So consider yourself owned on this case, Matthew. Yeah, it's... um. I don't know. It's just like reading that. First, you're perplexed. You're like, what is, like, what am I reading? You know? Mm-hmm. Right. Then you kind of get angry. You're like, this is incredibly offensive. And then it's almost like it's absurd. Did they cite to it? Did they have a table of contents with citations? Yeah, with the web address linked. Oh, because a lot of times I'll get evidence packets from ICE that are literally just articles stapled together. Like there's no table of contents or indication of like when they access these articles or where they're from. Yeah, no, she did a little better job. And there is one blog post from an associate professor from the University of Vermont who's making the same argument that Mexico is more progressive than the United States. 
but she has this one paragraph like right in the middle of her thing saying like, uh -huh. however, we have to emphasize that the police commit violence with impunity against the LGBTQ community and laws aren't really enforced. <laughs> so it's like that's quite a parenthetical, right? <laughs> yeah. Other like, than this, other than this, yeah, everything is great except for the actual reality. I do think this is something we've talked about before, and I caught an immigration judge basically admitting that he'd been to Mexico 20 years ago, and it was fine, and they had pharmacies 20 years ago, and so I I've always had this feeling with the judges that they've probably been to Mexico. And have you been to Mexico? Have we had this conversation a million times? Uh, I've only been to Tijuana for a night. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we don't need to get into whatever that was about. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you go to Mexico, if you go to any of the sort of resorty places, Cancun, Puerto Vallarta, Baja California, Baja California, what am I thinking? Puerto. Uh, well, there, there is a Baja California, so. Right, right. It's sort of Las vegas -y in that like it's all designed for tourists. And so, you know, there's nice taxis, there's limo taxis, and they'll take you to the strip of beautiful hotels on the beach. And, and you're very insulated, but you might not understand that, right? You might just come away with the impression that like, this is Mexico everywhere. But like those people on their gaycation, there's a huge difference between a gaycation and like, then driving into the interior of Mexico for the rest of your life. Right. And that's what, well, you know, it's funny because we certainly have enough, we should have enough experience with that here in this country where if you come to Philadelphia, if you go down to old city where the Liberty Bell is and all that, it's really nice. And you know, there are a lot of tourists around there are, restaurants, everything's very, safe. you know, safe. And you go into center city, Philadelphia, the same thing. If you go out into the outer neighborhoods up in North Philly and West Philly, it tends to get a little rougher. I mean, this shouldn't be. That dynamic exists in Yakima, right? I mean, like it's everywhere. Right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this concept of a place, a city or a locale having a nice center area or touristic -y or business area. And then having the outskirts that are a little more dodgy it shouldn't really be a foreign concept. But for some reason, with, you know, oh, you can just go to Honduras, you can go to whatever resort in Honduras or El Salvador or wherever, because every country is going to have these little spots. Sure. Mm -hmm. Now, just so some of the listeners who might not be so aware, one thing when you're seeking asylum and this type of protection, if there is a safe place for you to go in your country, you have to go there, right? So that's usually the point. Well, you can just go to this nice, safe space, especially if you're not talking about government oppression or persecution on you. Then you have to show why you can't be safe in any part of that country. But telling a poor gay person that you can just go to these like resort towns, mm -hmm. I guess maybe she could stay at the Alma Resort. Maybe I should call them up to see if I can like arrange something <laughs> right. with them. And oh, yeah. she would be fine there. And maybe if she could spend the rest of her life in a nice resort. I mean, I think me and you are kind of looking for that opportunity right now. So if I any of these some. like resorts want to let oh, me and Steven right. stay forever for free, we'll promote <laughs> the hell out of you. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, yeah. Do, we'll do the podcast from there. You know, are you, are you inviting me on a vacation? You know, if it's a resort like that for the rest of our lives, I think we, I, I don't know. We have to hell think yeah. about it. All right, sweet. <laughs> the thinking has been done as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, so I thought that was funny. But kudos to them for at least trying and filing some evidence. So that's good. Yeah, and she also wants to um, cross-examine the mental health professional who did the mental health evaluation. Because mm -hmm. she's a little concerned about, I guess, the veracity of the report from this professional with this like CV that's five pages long. Right. But blog posts are, you know cool yeah anyway it'll be interesting we'll see what happens so funny to me um it's been kind of a weird week because it's seen the resurfacing a week or two maybe at this point of all these weird figures eric Cantor was doing the shows 
John Boehner, he's got a book out. So he's doing all the shows and our old friend of the show, George W. Bush doing all the shows. Does this feel like, uh, not to get tinfoil hatty about it, but does this feel like some sort of coordinated thing to you where like, I mean, what is happening? Why are all these people being invited back into polite society? I don't know if it's coordinated, but I think it's just, one, I don't think there's as much news. Like when Trump was president, there was always something crazy, really crazy to talk about. And now I, I think they're doing, well, maybe coordinated in a way is they want to show like how bad the Republican Party is now compared to what they think it was before in order maybe to, you know, kind of put the Biden presidency in perspective, if yeah, that makes I, sense. I guess, but we got a couple of clips. Uh, <laughs> John Boehner, just a bag of alcohol and cigarette smoke. Um, <laughs> he's on Meet the Press with Chuck Todd. And I mean, a, a bigger question is, why does Chuck Todd have a platform at all? <laughs> I mean, do you, do you know anyone who likes the guy? Uh, no. So here's uh, John Boehner being asked this question by Chuck Todd. Let me ask something about the white supremacist. Let me ask something. Stuff that just keeps trying to get this stuff that just keeps trying to into the mainstream into the conservative movement. I feel like the Republican Party that you grew up in did a pretty good job of trying to eradicate this. Okay, so first of all, Matthew's head is on the desk. How old is John Boehner? He's got to be 65, right? It's pretty old. Probably in the 70s, right? I mean, Nixon invented the Southern strategy. It was all about... So the retort from Republicans is, well, who was against the civil rights movement and KKK? You know, they were all Democrats. But we know in yeah, any person who's moderately studied history, American history, understands that in the early 60s, the mid 60s, all the Dixiecrats, Democrats, moved over to the Republican Party right. because their racist <laughs> was no longer welcome in the Democratic Party. So they brought their racist <laughs> over to the Republican Party. And... So this whole like, oh, like just white supremacist, <laughs> like this is a new thing in the, in the Republican Party is yeah. crazy. They forget that George Bush was president. They forget that John Ashcroft was the attorney general. Like these things just don't th seem to have happened or they've happened right. in a different manner than they remember. No, I know. But it, we haven't even gotten to the good part of the clip, but the, <laughs> it's a good point that the foundation of the question is just like, you guys used to be super good anti-racist. And uh, what and, happened, do yeah. you think? And it creeped back in, whether... It super creepy, like very quiet, under the radar. Creeped in via libertarian movements or whatever. It creeped back in and you see it. You've gone from one problem in Steve King and it's... Okay. <laughs> Again, reducing the problem of racism on the right to a single congressman, right? I mean, he does say creep back in. So maybe that's an acknowledgement that it was there, then it was gone, and now it's back. Well, I, yeah, I guess. Let's see. Pesticized. Now they're trying to start a caucus that's sort of based on these, on these um, racist ideas. How did this happen? How did this get mainstreamed a bit in your party? Well, Chuck, I have no idea how uh, this even showed up. I wouldn't call it mainstreamed in our party, uh, but I can tell you that... Uh, uh, this so-called America First Caucus is one of the nuttiest things I've ever seen. Uh, listen, America is a land of immigration. We've, uh, we've been the world's giant melting pot uh, for 250 years. Uh, and uh, we ought to celebrate the fact that we are this giant melting pot. Uh, and to see some members uh, of Congress go off and start uh, uh, this America First Caucus is I, it's the silliest thing I've ever, ever seen. And Republicans need to deny. <laughs> How many drinks has he had? <laughs> it's the silliest thing he's ever seen. But he literally was Speaker of the House during the whole Obama wasn't born in the United States thing. <laughs> right. We're gonna, we're <laughs> so, gonna get I mean, uh -huh. did he not remember that part? I mean, did he overlook it? Does he think it's not as nutty as the <laughs> America First thing? I mean. Yeah, he's got a scale of nuttiness, I guess. He That's... lived through Freedom Fries. 
<laughs> he right. lived through Muslims, yeah. immigrants having to register, all Muslim immigrants having to register under George Bush, which we people forget yeah, about or they don't no, know uh, right. the end Sears program. Because quite frankly, if Trump did it, everyone would have been up in arms. Trump didn't do it because he like knew that wouldn't fly. But George Bush did it. So this whole thing about, you know, the Republican Party has really gone off the rails. Mm-hmm. And people like John Boehner are just looking at it going, I, I have no idea wow. how this could have happened. How could this have happened? No, I mean, they might be worse now than they were back then. I mean, I think we could maybe stipulate to that. But it's kind of a straight line, right? Right. So, right. By their definition, by the way, of immigration, they would basically say there shouldn't be Asian Americans uh, citizenship in this country the way that's described. I don't think people realize how cruel that that some of that stuff was said there, right, Mr. Speaker? I think it's. What is he talking about? I I, I don't know. Quite cruel, and it has, frankly, it has no place in the Republican Party. You know, my second biggest regret uh, during my time as Speaker is not being able to come to an agreement with President Obama Mm -hmm. on an immigration reform bill. Our immigration system is a mess. It's broken from top to bottom. Uh, And it needs to be fixed uh, so that it's fair. You know, it Uh, is too bad that as Speaker of the House, he never had the ability to put an immigration (laughs) reform bill on the floor of the House that the Senate had passed. It's too bad that he was never in a position to do anything about that. Actually, okay, I'm going to stop the clip there because annoying uh, f- this guy <laughs> but okay so he was speaker of the house right yeah, yeah and uh at a time 2013 do you remember this when they passed comprehensive immigration reform out of the senate remember that yeah yeah i was um i was kind of hopeful i actually had a few cases continued during that time frame because there were some ijs i was down in miami at the time we were kind of convinced that immigration reform was going to happen sure I remember going to meetings and people saying, it's not even a question of whether or not it will pass. The devil's going to be in the details, like what exactly is going to be in it. And this was not like some lefty bill, right? This was not like the world's greatest amnesty. It was full of all kinds of compromises. So this is really a bipartisan bill that had bipartisan support in the Senate. And they came together, they've got the thing passed. And then what happened? Nothing. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, the House didn't bring it up for a vote. Right. And anyone who's watched Saturday morning TV understands how a bill becomes law, right? You know, the House right. has to pass it too. Was there like one single person who could have made it come to the floor for a vote? You know, I think the, the leader of the House, they call them the Speaker, the speaker. Yeah. I, I think it was acknowledged that there were enough votes in the house for it to pass. Right. And so that would have been John Boehner, the guy who just said, now he did say he regretted, but then he said not being able to come to an agreement with president Obama as if he and Obama shared some sort of blame. Right. Like, like yeah. I mean, the Senate passed it just so people you don't know, remember. or don't know the Senate passed it. The House would have passed it. They had the votes. They had the votes. But John Boehner decided there was stuff in there he didn't like. He wanted changed. So he's the one that made the decision. Because he could have said, like, we're going to put forward our own bill with these specific changes because we think the Senate bill goes too far in A, B, and C. And so we're going to, you know... We're going to have this negotiation. There wasn't even that. And not only that, but he didn't articulate the reasons why he was opposed. So this is uh, from 2014. He gets into it a little bit with Jorge Ramos about that immigration bill, which at the time of this questioning had been passed by the Senate for over a year. So here's what Boehner had to say about why he wasn't taking any action. So, Speaker, uh, we came here to ask you why are you blocking immigration reform? It's been almost a year since the Senate. Me? Passed. Yes, you're blocking. Yes, yeah, you could bring it to a vote, and you haven't. It's been it's been almost a year since the Senate. Well, the issue of immigration before. reform is an issue that I've talked about uh, for 18 months. Uh, but the president, the president has responsibility here as well. And when he continues to ignore uh, Obamacare, his own law, 38 unilateral delays, he reduces the confidence 
of the American people in his willingness uh, to implement an immigration law the way we would pass it. So the president has to rebuild this trust if we're going to be able to do this. What does that mean? <laughs> does it mean anything? I don't know. I don't. <laughs> I, I don't know. And so just so people can fully remember, you know, this was a time period where Obama was really ratcheting it up deportations and enforcement and all that. So it wasn't like Obama just stopped. It wasn't deporting people, you know, things. This was even, I'm pretty sure this was pre DACA, right? I uh, know this is, this is 2014. So DACA had been in place for a couple of years. Okay. But like, first of all, that's also a bull reason to not pass immigration yeah. reform to say like, he's done DACA. So we're mad about that. But like, that would have at least been a reason. And here he's saying, Obama's done some stuff on Obamacare that we don't like. And so the president's been naughty and he's got to like earn trust back or something. Yeah, it didn't make it didn't make a lot of sense. I, it doesn't make any sense. And I, I do want to play one more clip of our old friend, uh, John Boehner, when he says he's totally unsure where racism would have come from. Let's listen carefully to his response to this question. This is January. 2011 on the question of whether or not Obama was a U.S. citizen. I'm curious as to how much responsibility you feel specifically because of something that happened this morning. During the reading of the Constitution, Congressman Frank Pallone of New Jersey was reading a portion of the document interrupted by uh, someone who heckled from within the chamber. It was to express doubt over the president's American citizenship. Uh, provided you believe the president is an American citizen. you got 12 members co-sponsoring legislation that does about the same thing. It expresses doubt. Would you be willing to say this is a distraction? I've looked at it to my satisfaction. Let's move on. The state of Hawaii uh, has said that President Obama uh, was born there. That's good enough for me. First of all, that part of the answer is... <laughs> not good enough right it's yeah because in order to take that assurance right you had to have a doubt right right it's it's right. like with you i don't need to i don't even know were you born in washington state right yeah so i, I mean i don't need washington state to confirm it for me i mean mm. right so maybe i should well it's sort of like i mean you could be canadian has anyone is Matthew a serial killer? Well, his wife says he's not. So, yes, I guess not. Like, what? Anyways, you can see how he's sort of, he's hedging. But the second part of his answer is even worse. Uh, would you be willing to say that message to the 12 members in your caucus who seem to either believe otherwise or are willing to express doubt and have co-sponsored legislation along well, Brian, when you come to, to the Congress of the United States... There are 435 of us. We're nothing more than a slice of America. And people come, with, regardless of party labels, they come with all kinds of beliefs and ideas. Uh, it's it's the, the melting pot of America. Uh, it's not up to me to tell them what to think. Yeah, so this uh, racism, huh, really took us off guard. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I mean, you know, it's not up to him, the leader of his party and in, in that body to... Maybe right. even just only express an opinion on it. He had no place to correct those 12 people who were yeah. just a slice of America, right? Yeah. Just a slice of America coming to Congress, expressing views. Yeah. So another ghoul from our past that they tried to sort of dredge out was George W. Bush. I don't think we need to play any of his clips, but he... <sighs> He's coming out now saying, like, we have to treat immigrants with, like, respect and then mm -hmm. those, those types of things, which the words he, are, he is saying is nice, right? So I think if you look at it in a vacuum, you're like, well, that's nice. Right. It might be better if he said those words and then he said, now, I understand that when I was president, I didn't necessarily live up to these words. Yeah. And I, and I <laughs> right. regret right. that. But he does it and no one even pushes him on it. And that's the same thing with Boehner. Like if Boehner wrote a book and he said, look, the stuff that you're seeing now, this America First caucus, 
and all these things, you know, January 6th, I could have done more to stop it. You know, I think about the birther thing and how I didn't put, and instead to come out and be like, oh, what a strange thing to have happened. And for Bush, likewise, like you're saying, to say, yeah, you know, we need to be better to immigrants without recognizing, you know, he was president for eight years. Yeah. He was not an unpowerful person. And people that are living through this time frame, especially, you know, our fellow immigration attorneys that might not have practiced under Bush, they think about how horrible the attorney general sessions was in Barr and whoever else had Whitaker, whoever else filled in there. But under Bush, we had John Ashcroft. He was no peach. He sucked. And Bush, and, and again, I go back to it. He had Muslims, almost all Muslim immigrants, had to go down to the immigration office and register. And if they didn't register, it was a ground of getting removed from the United States. So right. we think about like the Muslim ban right. and how bad it was. But, you know, let's like step back and think if Trump had done that. And I think it maybe goes to a different frame of mind in the American public and maybe for the better, how people really rose up against the Muslim ban. And maybe it has to do with Trump's personality and his, the way he speaks, you know, apart to George Bush's and also right after 9-11 and all that. But, you know, that was a pretty dramatic step to take and pretty xenophobic, pretty racist, whatever you want to, you know, whatever ick or ism you want to put on it. That's what it was. And right. It would be nice if he acknowledged it and said, yeah, maybe that was not treating immigrants with respect and dignity. Right. Or we put in place some things like the entire Department of Homeland Security that haven't ended up really doing what they were supposed to do. Um, Or maybe they have done what they're supposed to do. And that's the problem. Yeah. And I mean, not to get too far off, but let's not. One thing we kind of discuss is how the Republican Party is moving further and further to the right which has given the Democratic Party room to kind of follow them. And it seems like the Democratic Party now is, as long as we're not as bad as them, we are okay. And, you know, the Democratic Party has to maybe own up to this too. When we look at Bill Clinton and how he treated Haitians, how he dealt with the border, how he created barriers and enforcement in the more passable areas of the border to force people into dangerous passages through the desert so that they would deter them from coming. And it didn't, it just ended up killing them. And so that mindset has stepped through. So it's not only Republicans who have, they might have led the charge to a more, even more racist and white supremacist based system that we have currently. But the Democrats are kind of following behind softly, like, okay, let's just kind of move up a little bit closer and closer. And the thing that we had talked about with like Hillary Clinton, where she said, Trump said wall, and she said, what, barriers and obstacles or or something like that. (laughs) You know, it's, oh, that's not as bad as a wall, but it's still the same type of purpose. Yeah, the perfect example of that, I think, is, build that wall, that's a horrible chant and a bad idea, which is true. But we saw Biden's press secretary, who's very good at her job, announce several weeks ago that we had reached an agreement with, I think, Guatemala and Honduras. In Mexico. In Mexico, do a better job putting soldiers on their borders to stop people from coming here, which is like, armed walls <laughs> in practice it's it's probably much worse than a physical wall in the desert and yet yeah, walls the, don't shoot and walls exactly. don't rape but yet if you say it in a very serious tone and you're on the left then there's this sort of sense that like oh we're being practical we're being reasonable and it just it's not True. And then we look at what Trump did with Title 42, invoking it, uh, a public health measure saying that immigrants coming in over the southern border because of COVID, we should expel all of them, including unaccompanied minors. Now, a federal judge told them that they couldn't exclude unaccompanied minors. 
So when Biden comes in, he makes this big announcement. We're not going to exclude unaccompanied minors, which hadn't been being excluded for the last few months because of a federal judge. Oh, we're not going to do that. But they'll expel everybody else, you know, families and individuals and all that. But it's better, right? So we're not as bad as Trump because we're not expelling unaccompanied minors. So Trump laid the marker down and all the Democrats have to do is don't cross that marker. Right. You know, dial it back half a notch. (laughs) Yeah, there is that dynamic. I brought this up to you before the show. Stephen Miller launched some sort of a legal, what's it called? America First Legal Foundation. Did you send in your resume or? (laughs) I sent in my resume. I'm waiting for a callback. Um, There is just this dynamic that I think exists. I don't want to disparage the work of many lawyers and activists over the last four years who proved themselves very capable of going into court and stopping terrible things. It sounds like you're about to do it. But I'm about to do it. No, but I think it's just undeniable that going back to the 70s, the right has machinery, anti-immigrant machinery in place from media figures like Rush Limbaugh and Mark Levin and, you know, talk radio to Fox News and then think tanks like CIS and FAIR. And these things sort of all work together in coordination like a well-oiled machine, right? To try and get (laughs) their ideas passed and to get their ideas implemented. And on the left, there's just nothing. There's, I mean, there's some groups, there's some organizations, but there's no like infrastructure. And not only is there not an infrastructure, but I don't even think that there's really an agreed to ideology when it comes to immigration on the left, which I think is one of the complicating factors. But I mean, what do you think about that? No, I mean, I think... What do you think about that? That's such a good question. (laughs) Let me say a bunch of stuff. What do you think? Well, I mean... you agree with me? (laughs) Well, I, I think... I think what the the right is unafraid to go as far as they say what I think they really want, right? Or almost what they really want, right? But they, they bring us close enough to it. You know, Trump can say, build a wall against across the entire southern border, have deportation forces come out. Stephen Miller can express all of these things. And Tucker Carlson can talk about... Um, replacement ideology or yeah replacement theory Mm -hmm. yeah they can say all these things and what it does is like okay trump was never going to get a wall across the entire southern border because that was ludicrous right but all of a sudden when you say a wall across the entire southern border that's ludicrous you know half the southern border doesn't sound as ludicrous right putting up barbed wire maybe isn't as ludicrous now so all these things They just push it and push it and push it. And the Democrats, like I've been saying, is they follow it. What the left really needs to do is get coherent messengers that can pull back the other way. We need people out there advocating for open borders. And if you say open borders, people, they throw their hands up in the air. They think you're crazy. But you know what's crazy? A wall across the entire southern border. That's crazy talk, right? And what the right had was someone who put that message out there. And so things less than that seemed not so crazy. And I think I want some major figure to start talking about things like open borders, because I don't think it's as scary as people believe it to be. And of course, open borders, and maybe sometime we can have someone who's really proficient in talking about the concept of open borders on is kind of a big topic. It can mean a lot of different things, right? But I think that's one of the problems with it. (laughs) It, I mean, honestly, because it it doesn't really mean anything. Build a wall. It's like you need a caveman brain to understand what that means. It is what it is. And but the thing is, like, we're not even if you willing. say open borders, but then you mean, well, but you got to have a passport and you need, you know, but they're not even willing to go into that direction. It's like, well, we can't talk about open borders because this guy's talking about building a wall. So that's too extreme. So and there's I mean, what people has been in the Democratic lexicon for 
decades now is incrementalism. Okay, we're just going to get this little bit. And then once we have this little bit, we'll get a little bit more and we get a little bit more. And then, you know, the right, the right will rightfully say, you know, hey, it's a slippery slope. They're just taking this and they're going to keep asking for more and more. And they put up the roadblocks there instead of just saying we want it all right now and then working back. Democrats will always negotiate against themselves. Right. I think one of the things that we have to, like, I guess, keep in mind is like Trump ran on a Muslim ban on most Mexicans being rapists and on building the wall and then won. Like he was rewarded for that. And the Democrats, you know, they ran on some ideas, but then the second somebody accuses them of being open borders, they have to try and prove how not open borders they are. And I don't know, I don't know if they would be rewarded in the same way for being in favor of open borders as a Republican would for running like an openly xenophobic and racist campaign. And I think that's their concern. But I mean, whatever it is that they're doing now is it's like incoherent. So they might as well be open borders if they're going to be accused of it. We see what Biden's doing, right? And they're saying that he's for open borders. Right. And so it's like, well, why don't you just, okay, if you don't want to have open borders, Joe Biden, because we know you don't, why don't you at least do stuff, you know, loosen stuff up, you know, Mm -hmm. Stop doing Title 42 expulsions. Get the attorney general to issue some decisions to overturn matter of AB and LEA and Castro-Tome and all these things, right? Right. You know, start doing these things because what you're doing now is just like a notch below what Trump did. And they're still saying you're for open borders. So it just doesn't matter. Right. They will say the same thing no matter what. So I, I don't know why. And well, do you think, so I have thoughts on this. Do you think he's trying to appease them or do you think he's just doing what he would like to do? Oh, right. I'm more and more leaving the camp of like, oh, they're trying to play some sort of complicated chess or like with Obama, we were always saying he's trying to build up his bona fides so that they can get immigration reform passed. So we were ascribing to Obama some sort of like more progressive view than what he was actually showing because we thought he had some sort of secret agenda or intent. And I'm, I'm abandoning that view. I'm now more of the view that like the reason why Democrats aren't for open borders is because they're not for open borders, not necessarily just because they're afraid of being called that or yeah. they're trying to be tough to get some concessions. No, I think that they really don't view the border that way. So, you know, Biden can say he didn't want to lift the refugee cap because he was afraid of how it looked. But at the end of the day, like, if you have the power to lift the refugee cap and you don't, it doesn't really matter to me if, like, you don't because you're scared or because in your heart you, like, don't care about it. It's the same thing, right? What's the difference? I mean, there have been... And if you're on Twitter and you're on the immigration law, Twitter side, you know, there have been a slew of like these superstars, right, who have gone into the Biden administration every once in a while. You'd be like, oh, and so and so. And there are people, honestly, I don't know. You know, a lot, a lot of these people I'm not so familiar because I'm not really in, in that game. But, you know, people that I respect will be saying, oh, this person is great. Mm -hmm. And all these great people have gone there and you're kind of optimistic and then nothing happens. And then, of course, you'll get the like, oh, you have to be patient because they have to get whatever. I mean, there's not much we can do, right? (laughs) So, you know, it's not like we're being patient. It's just like, what are we going to do, right? We can send out, you know, tweets about it. We can rant about it on the podcast. But at the end of the day, we're going to see what happens. But I haven't seen so much positive from all these like immigration advocate human rights superstars. Yeah. We're on our, I think fourth wave of like rumors. Uh, I I don't know if you keep seeing these. I talked to a TA today in New York and they're super expecting something big to come down. I talked to TAs and they tell me they don't know a thing. And these are the TAs I believe. Right. 
Me too. Yeah. I mean, I talked to TAs in Newark and I'm like, when do you think like some of these judges are going to come back? Because in Newark, we have half the judges haven't done anything the entire pandemic. And they're like, we have absolutely no idea. We don't, no one tells us anything. And if anyone right. tells you different, they're just lying. They're just like making shit up. Right. So I don't really think they know anything. And there might not be anything to know. But <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. I'm just, I'm done with rumors. I, I don't believe them anymore. And again, I think we mentioned this last week. You know, we're not asking, well, it would be nice for them to like admin close all immigration removal cases and then reopen by motion of either party. That was your idea. And I think that's the only possible solution, honestly. But I mean, other than just like getting rid of the whole thing, but we're not even asking for that. We're just like, how about anything? Like any policy change? Yeah. Any or some guidance as to what they could possibly do if they wanted to. Like, like even some like murky, like, you know what, if you guys want to kind of continue a case indefinitely until we can figure out admin closure or like you want to stipulate to relief, just go, not even a mandate, just kind of some murky thing. Cause now it's nothing. And it's right. There's so many bad BIA cases from the Trump administration. Like just do one of them, throw one of them out. Like, give us a thing to be a... (laughs) Something that we can come on. And you know what? We'll dedicate the entire show to it. Yeah. If you toss Matter of AB, you got the entire show. Dude, do Matter of JGG. I don't even care. Like, it doesn't need to be a big (laughs) one. Do a small one. (laughs) Which one's JGG? (laughs) That's the one where the board is like, uh, you need to prove the non-existence of a service or a medication like in the entire country and if you don't then oh, it's not hardship yeah cool <laughs> all yeah. right well we were going to talk more about the right wing machine and replacement theory and how tucker carlson is a nazi but i think people have covered that i think we're out of time <laughs> yeah well i do think it's important that people be aware because you know what a lot of people watch that show and the thing that's sneaky about Tucker Carlson, for you and me, because we're woke and awesome, it's super obvious what he's doing. Well, I think the Venn diagram of people who watch Tucker Carlson and listen to this show um, <laughs> <laughs> might, might not have that different. much yeah. color in the middle. No, but I mean, I think it's good for people to, like, I went home and I saw Tucker Carlson on my dad's DVR. Like, what? <laughs> And uh, I was kind of surprised by that. But, you know, people need to be prepared to engage on that level, I think, with their loved ones, because a lot of people are buying into some stuff that's not so great. Anyhow, we'll talk about that next time, maybe. Maybe. All right. All right, Stephen. Good to see you. Good seeing you. Adios. Ciao.